Vodka, and here we go. Doug, where are you? I'm in San Diego, San Diego, California. And Lisa, where are you? DC. DC. And what part of Texas are you in? Uh, beautiful downtown Austin, Texas. Oh, okay. Oh. I could open my window and you could see the Capitol. The city within Texas that's not really part of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's what some of Texas would like, but no, we fully claim our Texas hood. I'm going to unmute. We're beginning to have um, participants um, coming into our session. And for those of you who have joined us, we will be starting in a minute. It looks like we've got great participation. And I'll just give people a couple more minutes to come online and we will, we will get going. Okay, I'm going to get our panel started. And first, let me introduce myself. I'm Rose Bott, and I'm on the faculty of the ILR School. I'm the Alice Hansen Cook Professor of Women in Work. And I'm so happy to be hosting this panel today and be part of this exciting uh, workshop that we're doing to celebrate Lois Gray and the 75th anniversary of the ILR School. Our panel today is focused on the theme of a worker-centered recovery. And we have three terrific speakers who are going to address different aspects of this very important and huge issue that we all face in this country. Um, and we're going to focus on different ways to address the ongoing uh, issues of inequality, how we reverse them, uh, that through um, movements and policies to bring about social and economic justice for all. So I'm going to introduce the panelists and each of them are going to take about six or eight minutes to present an overall view of what they're working on in their respective areas. And then we will move to a question and answer period. Um, so we wanna make this very dynamic and in interactive. Uh, we have with us Sanjay Pinto who will be bringing together the questions. So please, type in a question in the question and answer uh, box whenever you want to. We also have our chat box open for you to put comments and have a discussion among yourselves as well. Um, so thank you very much. Let me turn first to our speaker, Lisa Donner, who is the executive director of the Americans for Financial Reform a really important group in Washington that has created a coalition of over 200 groups throughout the country to fight against Wall Street billionaires and to right the wrongs of the financial system so that we can create a more equal and inclusive um, uh, economy. 
and I'm going to move to opening it to her, her and then uh, we'll we'll stop and um, move on to our next panelist. Thank you so much, Lisa. Great. Well, thanks so much, Rose, and, and thanks to everybody uh, uh, who's part of the conversation today. I'm really glad to be with you. Yeah, so it is not news to, I don't think anyone in this group to say that the COVID crisis and its particularly devastating impacts on Black and Latinx and Indigenous people has made the depths of inequalities of wealth and of systemic racism in this country particularly clear, but it is important to say and to keep saying uh, before the pandemic crisis, inequality, crisis, inequality and the concentration of wealth in the US had reached levels not seen since the 20s. Uh, and this crisis, along with the failures and limitations of the first responses to it, have only amplified uh, these differences. Over the past five decades, the top 1% of American earners have nearly doubled their share of national income. And meanwhile, something like 40% of the total population in the US are either poor or low income. And the incomes of the top 0.1 and 0.01% have grown even faster than the rest of the 0.1%. During the pandemic uh, in this year, the combined wealth of the nation's now 664 billionaires increased by 45% uh, to reach $4.3 trillion. And that $4.3 trillion owned by 664 people uh, compares to a total wealth of 2.4 trillion for the 165 million people in the whole bottom half of the wealth distribution. The 400 richest Americans own more wealth than all Black households, plus a quarter of Latinx households combined. Uh, all this happening while last week another close to a million people applied for unemployment and continuing claims are nearly 17 million uh, above where they were a year ago before the virus. 30% of Americans say their current household income is lower than it was when the pandemic began. 38% of Hispanic and 29% of Black Americans have experienced a layoff in their household at some point during the past year, as of 21% of white Americans, and about half of those who experienced any form of household income loss during the pandemic say their current household income is lower than it was before. These are pretty devastating uh, numbers and facts. Our specific focus at Americans for Financial Reform is on the ways in which finance and the rules that structure the financial system are key drivers of this inequality and of precarity for so many millions of people. It's not just, it's not just how much people have at the top, it's that they have taken that uh, from the rest of us and the consequences of that. Uh, and the ways in which changing the rules for Wall Street are a very crucial lever for rebuilding a more just economy. At a 50,000 foot level, the you know, expert literature set suggests that increased financialization in the sense of finance a share of GDP and corporate profits is correlated with greater economic inequality across the, the globe. In the day to day, we can see a whole bunch of ways that that actually plays out. Companies use earnings for stock buybacks, which enrich shareholders and executives at the expense of investments in worker wages or benefits or training or research and development that could feed more equitable growth. And it's not just stock buybacks. Deals across the economy are structured to produce maximum short-term profits for financiers extracting wealth from everyone else. Those people fortunate enough to have money say, to save for retirement more and more have to do so on their own uh, in a system where the people who you know, pulled themselves out as advisors are actually paid in ways that compensate them more to, for investments that pay you less, <laughs> costing tens of billions of dollars a year. Poverty wages create an opening for more and more credit products like payday loans and overdraft fees, which transfer billions of dollars a year from those who could least afford it to financial firms and executives. Speculative finance makes money for Wall Street traders or drives extractive financial products like predatory mortgages while diverting capital from other uses and putting the stability of the overall economy at risk, as we saw so devastatingly in the 2008 financial crisis. We could take the example of private equity, a subject which Rose and her colleague Eileen Applebaum uh, have done pioneering work on and, and an interest we share. Uh, private equity abuses, I think, are kind of like a financialization made extreme, <laughs> like a, a set of practices that extract wealth from workers and firms and patients and communities and transfer it to the people at the top of these firms. There are lots of variations, but a core PE model is for these owners to take control of companies by loading them up with debt in what's called a leveraged buyout. And it's the acquired company, not the PE firm, that's responsible for repaying it. And that 
puts the firm, the PE firm, in a kind of a heads I win, tells you lose situation where they can win if the company does well, but they can also win by draining the company's resources to pay themselves, hurting and even destroying the businesses that would otherwise survive and the workers and the communities and the people who used to be served by it. And meanwhile, they insulate themselves from liability for harms the firm might cause to workers or to patients or to the environment. One sector, just to give like one more specific example, a sector where PE has been particularly active is retail and taking a look at its impact there is instructive. There are lots of things going on that impact retail, but before the pandemic, PE ownership was a driving force in retail bankruptcies. Nearly two thirds of all retail bankruptcies in the five years prior to the pandemic were at PE owned retailers. Uh, and uh, there have been a ton of, of uh, of uh, retail bankruptcies during the pandemic as well. More than half a million jobs were slashed at PE owned retailers over the past 15 years. And these were job losses that disproportionately impacted women of color uh, who make up a disproportionate share of that workforce. And then as the pandemic be began, there were another 215 workers who are at particular risk of job loss because they were at PE owned chains at risk of bankruptcy uh, because of that financial scheme. So what does all that mean for thinking about a more equitable recovery? Uh, well, there were good pieces of the first rounds of response, but also too much of the help went to finance and to big business with no accountability or attention to whether or not assistance was making sure workers were paid and workers were safe and too little attention to making sure that the response increased rather than you know, still further setting back equity and too little attention to the fact that without specific steps to deal with it, this crisis will be an opportunity for private funds to still further expand their grip on the economy. So a couple of policies that we're focused on to try to change that first, uh, that the urgency of changing the rules so that workers and jobs and housing and patient care are not put at risk by runaway financial engineering is greater than ever. We and lots of partners have developed, for example, a set of proposals to do exactly that. I think Bill was introduced uh, last year called the Stop Wall Street Looting Act that we expect to be reintroduced again this year that has a variety of measures to close loopholes and stop special favors that allow financial firms to capture the rewards of their investment while passing the costs on to everyone else. It includes closing the carry interest loophole too, not, uh, which further rewards private equity financiers with a special lower tax rate. And simply closing that tax loophole is one of a number of ways of taxing Wall Street speculation or taxing extreme wealth that we think should be part of the extreme recovery, the recovery package, excuse me, along with a financial transaction tax and ultra millionaires tax and more. The crisis should also be prompting lawmakers to take a particularly hard look at the role of extractive private funds in healthcare. Uh, in the last month or two, a, a very striking new report came out uh, showing that this is before the crisis, deaths were higher uh, and costs were higher. Uh, at PE owned homes. And we did a report focused on nursing homes in New Jersey where there was good data during the crisis and found that deaths and cases were higher for patients and for workers at PE owned homes. Huge resources have gone to healthcare in the crisis as they need to, we really need to make sure that those dollars are serving patient care and safe jobs at living wages, not simply feeding profits at the top of financial firms. Uh, that's about stopping bad stuff. We also wanna be thinking about alternatives. And one idea we and many allies really like is that of a public investment bank. Uh, the bank would have a multi-part mission of supporting the transition to a green economy, investing in historically marginalized communities, developing crucial infrastructure and nurturing sustainable domestic manufacturing. All of those with core requirements for high road living wage jobs. It'd be a source of patient capital directed with a public mission, not as a replacement for direct federal investment, we need that too, but as a supplement to it and an alternative to financing only available for projects that produce maximum short-term profits. So there's lots of other lots of other pressing needs on dealing with the burden of student debt and the looming housing crisis and, and much more, but I'll stop there uh, to pass the microphone to other panelists. Thank you so much, Lisa, that was terrific. And um, as you see, we know how complex these financial issues are, and that's why we need to get the information to our constituencies to really tackle, take on Wall Street uh, when these financiers pretend that, oh, it's much too complicated for common people to look at, and we know that's not true. So taking a uh, open the veil and making these issues transparent so that we can all mobilize around them is important. And that is what AFR is doing. So thank you. 
Now I want to move to Doug Moore, who is the executive director of the United Domestic Workers of America, uh, which represents more than 140,000 in-home care providers and family uh, child care providers throughout California. He also serves as the international vice president of AFSPE. And I also want to thank him for getting up very early in the morning in California time to be with us on this panel. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Rose. And good morning to everyone. I hope everyone is well and doing good. Um, when you talk about a uh, worker-centered recovery, um, we have to remember you can't center what you can't see. And a lot of workers in our economy are invisible. And the first step in building a worker-centered e recovery is bringing those workers and the work that they do into the light. UDW members are some of those workers who need to be seen, not for what they do, but for who they are and how our society has worked to keep them down. Now our union represents about 120,000 home care workers who provide care to low income seniors and people with disabilities through the state's in-home support services system or IHSS program. These workers perform personal care tasks like help with dressing, meal preparation, and bowel and bladder care. It's not glamorous work, and it's often very challenging, but it allows their clients to live at home in comfort and dignity. Everyone should have the right to live in their homes if they choose, and our home care members are the people that make that possible. In the pandemic, our members' work became even more important. Keeping seniors out of institutional care became a matter of life and death. Yes, they have truly served as invisible heroes in the pandemic, but like so many unseen workers, they are in danger of being left behind by the recovery. It's easy to ignore what you can't see. We also represent 20,000 family child care providers. These are the workers, mostly women and in California, women of, co women, women of color who run small child care businesses out of their homes for families on subsidized child care. They provide quality, affordable child care to working families. The work our child care members do ensures that other workers can do their jobs. And without child care, our economy would grind to a halt. And during the pandemic, our members provided child care to the families of essential workers. And at the same time, their own expenses skyrocketed with cleaning protocols and supplies, as well as new costs like upgrading internet for kids in their care doing distance learning. And like our home care members, our members who are ch family child care providers have also been invisible heroes during the pandemic. So what makes workers invisible? In America, the answer is always the same, race and gender. Our entire membership, both home caregivers and child care providers is by majority, by majority women and people of color. Domestic workers and farm workers were written out of the National Labor Relations Act specifically because the work was done primarily by people of color. And our membership represents workers who were never meant to achieve equality, but have built power by joining together and leaning into what they do best, compassion and empathy. So how do we use power that our members have built so far and transition it for the moment that we are in, increase visibility. And how can we increase visibility in this moment? Organizing more workers and making sure our organizing is relevant to their lives and communities. Organizing domestic workers has always been challenging. Our members work in homes isolated without access to, to traditional workplace organizing tactics. 
The traditional model of a labor union fighting for better pay, benefits, working conditions for their members just isn't enough for the workers that we represent. There are so many forms of oppression intersecting to keep our members down. Racism, sexism, classism, anti-immigrant, and LGBTQ bias. We must fight on many fronts to lift them up. Our union has always been focused on the interconnection of economic inequality and in these other forms of oppression. It is woven into everything that we do. And the pandemic didn't change that. It made that focus even more important. The pandemic impacted our members and their communities disproportionately. They were more in danger of contracting the virus because they are frontline workers. And at the same time, they were more likely, likely to become ill or die of the virus because they are people of color. And there's no way to address these workers' economic needs in the recovery without addressing everything else. You see, you can't lift them up without fighting everything that is keeping them down. That means taking on police violence and mass incarceration, immigration reform, anti-Asian hate and violence. A worker-centered recovery will require addressing long-standing inequalities in the pre-pandemic economy and its connection to social justice. That's why we are seizing on this moment to bring our members more fully into the light. Early on in the pandemic, Governor Newsom designated home care members essential workers. And we advocated for them to be among the first to be offered vaccines and we have set up vaccine clinics in our union halls. But we're not slowing down on our economic or on our social justice work because of the pandemic. That work is more important than ever. Right now, we are sponsoring legislation to get killer cops off the streets and find alternatives to policing. We're working with the environmental groups to move oil and gas wells away from communities of color. And we are undertaking a major union-wide effort to educate staff and members on systemic racism. That is what we are looking for from our partners in, the labor, right, in labor right now, an understanding that our members' interests will never be solely economic. This is what our members need to live in a just and sustainable society. And we are following their lead. By, al by allowing workers such as our members to lead, we can rebuild not only what was lost during the pandemic, but a more just and equ equitable economy overall. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Your, your work is cut out for you. <laughs> There are so many fronts that you are fighting on, and we really hope that in the question and answers, we can get into some of the uh, various dimensions that you are working on and how you're really tackling uh, th these systemic problems. So I do want to encourage all of the um, people in the audience to submit questions. Um, and uh, Anytime during the presentations, we'll collect them. And after we hear from Rick, we will open it up for some discussion. So I want to move now to Rick Lovey, who is the president of the Texas AFL-CIO, a position he was elected to in 2017. Previously, he held the position of secretary treasurer um, uh, from 2015 to 19, and he be began with the state Fed in 1990 as the first legal director and subsequently general counsel. And he's going to talk about some extremely innovative efforts to tackle climate change in, of course, the belly of the beast, which is the Texas oil fields. So, uh, Rick, I welcome you. There had to be one person who wasn't mute, uh, who was on mute when they started talking, or else it wouldn't be a Zoom panel. Thank you, Rose. Thank you for having me, and thanks to the other panelists. Um, Lisa, your work is like 
so critical to this moment. And Doug, I just want to be you when I grow up. I mean, what y'all are doing there um, with your union and the vision that you bring to the work is really inspiring. So thank you for bringing it this morning and thank you for your work in general. It's really, really powerful stuff. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, Rose, you mentioned that we're in the belly of the beast. Um, we're, you know, the, the, the COVID crisis is, is you both have uh, already indicated um, has, also, has laid bare so many things in our society to those to whom it was not visible, to borrow your term, Doug. Um, and uh, when you talk about inequality, Texas has some of the most rampant inequality in the country. Um, we have tremendous wealth uh, concentrations, but we also have tremendous poverty. Um, we have the highest percentage of uninsured people in the nation. One in five Texans has no health insurance. Um, we have um, uh, about 4.8% union representation. Um, and we still have the minimum wage of $7.25. And I'll note that that's for people who are even covered by the minimum wage um, that doesn't cover a lot of agricultural workers of which there are also many in Texas. Um, so our economy is not an economy that works for everyone, even though there is tremendous wealth. Um, and then you layer that crisis of inequality on the climate crisis in Texas. And we've seen uh, a, a tremendous rise in the number of climate incidents, whether they be hurricanes or droughts um, or um, other things like that, that kind of make it clear to everybody that the way things are going is not the way uh, that it can be in a sustainable way. Um, we have a lot of challenges in Texas that way. Uh, a lot of our economy revolves around the fossil fuel economy. Um, a lot of our membership um, thrives in the fossil fuel economy, to be completely frank about it. And um, it's, it's, these are the, some of the best jobs in Texas. Um, we also have an incredibly high amount of pollution. We emit more um, pollutants than like twice as much as California, even though uh, the populations are what they are. So just uh, in, in the Texas labor movement, we've never really uh, historically addressed the issues of climate change because um, of where our membership and our density lays. Um, and um, that, I think we've been forced to reckon with that and to address that. And, and the, what we understand now is that we cannot tackle the, the crisis of climate change without tackling the crisis of inequality. Um, and uh, we cannot uh, separate those things because to truly address climate change, we have to put the interests of workers first um, in a way that has never been done by uh, the environmental movements that address this kind of issue. So how it came to our um, attention or how, how we finally got involved in this was we, we would always find ourselves split when it came to political candidates who would come and seek our support. Um, we would have candidates that would be very um, pro Green New Deal, but also pro union, um, and we would struggle um, in our environment, in our movement around how do we approach candidates that are both pro union, but whose policies seem to um, undercut the very economic foundation of so many of our members. Um, and that came to a head last year when um, uh, when we did, in fact, endorse uh, for the first time, two candidates who were trying to un unseat Republic, um, one Republican, one Democrat incumbent, who both supported the New Deal, but were really strongly union. And it caused a reckoning in our movement. And we had a real, uh, we had people who were very upset that those endorsements took place. Um, and so we had to begin a process of like, look, we can't just sit here and wait for uh, politicians to come and split us based on their candidacy or this. We have to come up with our own program, our own, pro our own program to address climate change, our own program to address economic security for members, our own program um, that is going to create new union jobs in the state of Texas, that's going to lift people out of poverty, that's going to give people the opportunity to get health insurance and, and, and retirement and actually a decent standard of living. And so we got together and we we talked about the fact that solidarity sometimes means that you show up on a picket line for somebody, another union. You show up at the legislature to fight a battle that maybe isn't your own union's battle. But sometimes it means sitting in a room and having tough conversations with each, with each other, identifying what common interests are, where we can move together, um, how we can 
find those common interests and act together in solidarity on those common interests. And so we've done that for the last year and now we're on the cusp of issuing our policy report with the help of um, folks at Cornell actually, if I'll say that, um, and uh, the National Climate um, Jobs Resource Center. And we are gonna be putting forth a, an incredibly broad and bold uh, program um, to transform our economy with union jobs and union workers at the center of it. Um, and it's a program that we've gotten buy-in from broad sectors of the labor movement, from, um, from virtually every sector of the labor movement who understand that unless we can organize, unless we can organize the new economy, then we're gonna be, we're never gonna achieve the real climate change we need and we're never gonna achieve the economic justice that we need um, in, in, this, in this state and in this country. So it's a, it's a deep undertaking. Uh, it's an undertaking that's uh, very challenging both internally um, and uh, in the context of the overall political environment in Texas, but we do know this, then unless we can focus on jobs and justice, um, then we're never gonna achieve the, the progress that we need in the areas of climate change or inequality. So that's what we're, that's the path that we're trying to head down. Um, we'll see where it takes us, we're excited to go um, and look forward to the remainder of the discussion. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, so you, I wanna move to the audience now. As you see, we have three uh, panelists who are engaged in incredible efforts to make change for a worker center uh, recovery. And we also have a number of questions from the audience. We want to move through a number of questions. So we'll ask the panelists to try to um, make your answers to the point and so we can cover a lot of these questions and we can really dig into the specifics of some of the work you're doing. So I wanna introduce Sanjay Pinto, who is uh, going to moderate um, uh, the questions and uh, he's going to come in with his video, I think, and uh, begin the question and answer period. So uh, uh, Sanjay. Thank you. And uh, can you start us off with uh, some questions that may be for all three panelists or for specific panelists? Yes, thank you so much, Rose. And thanks to all the panelists. Uh, we have some really great questions coming in. So let me start off with a couple. Um, first of all, for Doug and the other panelists, um, someone was asking, can you provide examples of systemic interventions that address racism in the workplace? what has worked well and what hasn't. And then secondly, in your opinion, what would be key elements of a just economic recovery for women, uh, for women workers and mothers? Um, what are some of the important fights to build their economic security? So why don't we start with Doug? Thank you, Sanjay. That's a lot to unpack there. Um, first, uh, just to give you some context, our members are not at work sites. They are in, they're in homes. So uh, we decided to have conversations with our members about systemic racism um, and how it impacts their lives. Our, our workers are low wage workers. And we started these conversations, not with a group of workers of color, actually, we started them with women who worked in rural counties and started because nobody, they, would, they just automatically assumed they were conservatives and didn't wanna hear about this. I said, but they're still our members. So let's go into these counties and start having brave conversations with our, our, our members and giving them an understanding what it means when we talk about white privilege, what that actually means. When we talk about systemic racism, how that impacts their daily lives. And once we started having these conversations, actually we got, a, there was a lot of curiosity. And uh, we started uh, a, a uh, civil rights, um, uh, uh, council and and we started training members on how to have these conversations with other members and we're doing that up and down the state uh, the states that we in that the counties that we're in in California are not San Francisco LA Alameda they are rural counties like orange well red counties like Orange County okay 
uh, San Diego, um, Riverside County. So they're, they're, they're counties that, are, that normally vote conservative, but we felt it was necessary to educate uh, our members on how this impacts their daily lives. So, and the best way to do that is not for staff to always do it, but to do trainings with your activists and have them go back into their communities and have these conversations. You're there for support, but have them lead. So that's how we lead with all of our work. It's always starting with, uh, if it's a big campaign, it always starts with a focus group to figure out the messaging that resonates with our members, surveys, uh, and not just getting out there to check a box. We really want to, we really go down deep and from a historical perspective on what has happened and how what happened. Uh, like nobody knew about the NLRB until we started talking about it, how they were excluded and why. And so you start talking about all this systemic racism. I said, even though we have bad police out there, that's a symptom of a larger problem. And that's the structure of systemic racism in America. And until we start attacking that, uh, we, will, we will continue to uh, have the same battles with the same results. So we're, we're not just um, looking to check a box. We really want to have deep conversations with our members about this and how it impacts their lives. Thank you, Doug. Fabulous. Um, Rick, do you want to jump in on this question? Yes, um, thank you. And Doug, yeah, the, the, what, what, I, uh, what I react to when you said about taking the conversations into the field and having conversations with people, I think that what we've seen is that, um, that we really do need deep conversations about race. Um, that, um, that, and I think something else that you said that really resonated was that our members' interests are much more than economic. And I think there's a growing understanding of how those things all fit together. And so what we've tried to do is create a space for those conversations to ha happen um, in Texas. So we have a group of leaders that are meeting um, to get deep with one another and come up with a kind of a program to help make the Texas AFL-CIO not, uh, not just a non-racist organization, but an anti-racist organization. Um, and um, going through some pretty deep study and training together um, and conversation to develop a program that, that we can take out into the field and give people a place to talk about race and how it impacts their lives as union members and people in this economy. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's, uh, I don't think we can, it, you, you, you can't address any of the issues that any of us are talking about on this call without addressing the fundamental issue of race in this country. Um, and until we do, and until all of our members are heard and seen in that way, um, we will still have much work to do. Lisa. I need to unmute. Um, I think uh, one, thing, one thing I'd add there uh, is that uh, in thinking about uh, how we uh, win the change that uh, the workers and leaders who uh, Doug and Rick are talking about engaging uh, are, uh, are fighting for. Um, important also to think about uh, who is profiting uh, from the uh, systemic racism uh, and from the, uh, the rules that uh, leave uh, workers, especially uh, in pieces of the care economy, so uh, desperately underpaid. It's not just an it's not just an accident. It doesn't just happen. It's not natural. Uh, someone is actually making more money <laughs> and invested in uh, trying to continue to make more money uh, by keeping those wages down uh, and by making those jobs. Uh, so difficult and keeping uh, that logic invisible uh, as well as the experience invisible. And so uh, for the rest of us to um, support uh, the leadership of folks doing those jobs, demanding change and being willing to take on uh, the, uh, the people who are 
profiting from the system as it works and defending it. So it's not it's not just this is wrong, but then you actually have to have a fight to change those rules. And there's there's people invested in keeping them that way. Yeah. And so we have to figure out how to uh, because they are profiting from them. So why is, uh, you know, why does it make sense for healthcare to be uh, and care to be structured in this way? And what can uh, what can we do uh, in solidarity with people leading the fights to change that uh, from the workplace uh, to take on the extremely powerful interests uh, that uh, are shaping it? Sanjay. And you may want to throw out a couple of related questions so we provide some opportunity here if you, if you have them. So you, mean, you might want to uh, send out one or two questions together, so so panelists have their choice. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Um, so there's some more great questions coming in. I think there was one on um, organizing direct care workers that I think Doug um, already spoke to and Lisa a bit. Um, but a question for everyone. So for people newer to organizing and movement building, what are some of the top mistakes that you see folks making? Um, what do you wish you would have known uh, prior to doing this work? Um, so that's one question for everyone. And then for Rick and others, what types of worker-centered policies are you hoping could be included in the upcoming infrastructure package that creates green jobs and also ensures that they can be union jobs? And then there was actually another related question on, on this um, topic having to do with potential tensions between union leadership and members and how you know how to navigate those kinds of tensions. Um, and then there, was, there were a couple of questions that came in about um, private equity. Let me try to summarize. So what's the best way to discuss the, the complexities of financialization and the damage that's being done by private equity with workers? And then um, there's a recent action by the Biden administration. Um, and how does this open up possibilities for worker pension funds to divest? Um, so that's a lot. Um, maybe we can start this round um, with Lisa and then move to Rick and Doug. Okay, uh, so maybe I'll start with the, the, the recent ESG rule um, and then turn to talking about uh, private equity. Uh, thanks for thanks for asking that. Um, as you as you know to unpack it a second for for others at the end of the. Trump administration, uh, the Department of Labor issued a rule that uh, was directed at trying to uh, make sure that uh, money would keep flowing to the oil and gas industry above all, that, but that would generally have made it more difficult for uh, pension funds to take not just environmental factors, but also uh, social and governance factors into account in making their decisions. Uh, there have already been numbers of significant challenges to doing it, but this rule change would have made that situation still worse. You know, the good news is that the uh, Biden administration has already said that they will not enforce that terrible rule. Um, and we hope that, the, and that they're considering what else to do. We hope that the what else to do will mean a much deeper reconsideration of what factors it is appropriate. Uh, for fiduciaries to take into account what the real interests of investors are, including their long-term interests uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a sustainable world uh, and in uh, governance practices that uh, feed the long-term health of a firm and employment practices uh, that are good for workers uh, and good for unions, after all, union members, pension funds uh, in many cases. And so I do think that both uh, uh, changing those rules um, and allowing just a, a broader and more realistic consideration of what material factors are uh, in an investment um, and around a, an investment's performance will be a huge opportunity uh, for funds to uh, make decisions uh, that are better for the planet and better for pe working people. Um, and I think it's also very clear that we will not only have to change the rules, which will in and of itself take a lot of organizing engagement, but also uh, educate fiduciaries and funds uh, about taking advantage of those expanded rules. And that part of that education will be uh, 
uh, direct work with, with pensions. And part of that will be continuing campaigning from the ground up, uh, asking for investment policies that, that uh, are guided by those broader principles. Um, on the how to talk about it front, um, I think, uh, I mean, I'll, we've done a bunch of our private equity uh, focused work in partnership with organizing groups, as well as in partnership with uh, academics and, and experts. And it's been really uh, remarkable, I think, and clear, our, our, you know, our colleagues at United for Respect, for example, who uh, organize with retail workers, the folks who have experienced these private equity buyouts, uh, know what's going on, going on. They can see the change uh, in management from uh, some commitment to making the, you know, at Toys R Us, making the store a place where people want to shop and serving their customers and, you know, doing work to make kids happy that uh, lots of people felt really proud of to uh, a focus on uh, cutting costs in order to extract more profit for people at the top that, you know, degraded the job that people felt like they were able to do uh, day in and day out before it then actually cost their jobs. And that dynamic was was really clear to people and the folks who experienced it, I think, are among the most eloquent uh, explainers of and clearest explainers of, of what's going on there. So I think, um, you know, we all have to do some work to uh, to lay this stuff bare, bare because it's made obscure on purpose, but it is not in fact that complicated. And it is, uh, it is evident uh, and listening to the, the people who have experienced the impact is a, is a great way uh, to learn about what's going on and for other people to see it more clearly in their own experiences. Great, Lisa. Let me just add, um, for those of you who don't know, 35% of the money that goes into private equity comes from our pension funds, workers' capital. If we mobilized to get unions to disinvest from these horrible investment vehicles, we could put money to work in investing in companies with environmental labor and governance rules that we respect. And so there's a big mobilization that we need to do on that score too. So let me move to- uh, Can I add one other thing? Just, uh, just to say that actually just last week, uh, the uh, last week or this week, I lose track of time. The American Federation of Teachers and, and we uh, put out a paper actually that uh, detailed both the fact that uh, uh, the harms that can come uh, and the risks that can come to pension funds uh, from private equity investment and the fact that the returns are nothing as like as good as what they promise because that's how they that's how they attract that investment is they promise outsized returns and as they they hold themselves out as the only possible source of them and it turns out that's not true and I think this paper will be uh, extremely useful to those conversations I just wanted to flag it. Hey Rick. Yeah so um, uh, you're talking about private equity and we've been talking about climate you know I'm reminded you know that in the here in the energy capital of the world we had a winter storm that knocked out power for millions and millions of Texans some of whom still do not have running water um, and that we uh, all of a sudden heard again about the deregulation of our energy market in Texas that we do not regulate uh, the generation of power in Texas, which led directly to uh, the crisis that we experienced. And then we think back to when that law was passed um, in the early 2000s. And the forces behind that law, private equity, Enron, remember Enron? Um, it's a shell game. And that's what, you know, when Lisa talks about, it doesn't have to be this way. These are, these are conscious choices that policymakers have made. And when we talk about politics, you know, it, it's just so frustrating that people are so turned off about politics because politics is how we write the rules. There's nothing that comes down from on high that says, um, you know, our economy has to be structured this way. There's nothing that comes down from on high that says that domestic workers need to be marginalized economically. There's nothing that comes on high, anything like that. And, and it's about who makes the rules and how those rules get made. And so, um, 
you know, you, you have to take that into account as you address these kinds of issues. So it's, um, you know, it, it touches every aspect of all the work that we do. And the thing that I think is so heartening to me here being in Texas is that, is that for so long, um, folks would ignore what happened in the South. Um, that, you know, we were seen as kind of right to work, no, not worth investing in, not worth the, uh, the trouble that it would take. It's so much easier to invest other places. But if, as we've seen, that what starts in the South no longer stays in the South. And we've seen the expansion of right to work. We've, exe we've seen um, the, the kind of uh, launching pad of ridiculous right-wing political ideas have now become mainstream nationally. Um, and so what we've seen now is the unions are understanding that in order to really change this country, we have to change the South. We have to organize in the South. I'm so excited that unions are starting to organize in the South. We've had um, industry after industry where unions have made real commitments to workers in Texas and it's paying off and it's showing. And so as we continue to see that elevated level of organizing, um, it leads to increased political activity and hopefully um, we can um, join some of our other, other friends in Georgia and places where we can really turn this country around. Because look, once we turn around Texas, there will never be another Donald Trump elected as president. So um, let's, uh, let's get to work. Thank you, Doug. Um, you know, Rick, I'm gonna pick up where you left off on when it comes to organizing in the South. Uh, too many times our unions would come in, parachute in and parachute out, and leave as soon as they can when they lost the election instead of building first, building community, building relationships, and training folks who live there to be good organizers. They bring in staff out of state who, who are not familiar with it, uh, how, how the South works and, um, and, uh, and they, can't, they can't survive. They don't make the real investment. Uh, my first assignment when I was with Ask Me on staff was to go to uh, San Antonio, Texas and do an internal organizing campaign because they lost membership. And I asked, well, how many members did they have before? They said 1,400. I said, how many did they have today? They said 63. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and it took me understanding the community and staying there for 18 months to build it, but also looking for leaders who could sustain it and giving them that power to sustain it. Same thing that we do in UDW today is we lead through our members. We just passed a, a uh, dues restructure um, uh, camp. We just did a dues restructure campaign during the pandemic to because uh, we had not done a dues increase since 2006. And um, I wasn't the face of that campaign. It was our members, but we did the work. We did the work. We did the focus groups. We did the surveys to find out what resonated. And um, we had, we had the vote came back 90% in favor of it during the pandemic. Uh, but we also, they also saw the work that we did on the ground too. They saw that we were providing food pantries. They saw that we were doing PPE distribution. They saw that we were doing the COVID shots that we got from the state. And uh, so they could actually see the work that the union, that their union was doing. So uh, when they see outcomes, they tend to stay because our union, uh, all of our members are volunteer members. You know, we, we do have right to work in California, started in 2014 with Harris versus Quinn. Yeah. And we actually grew versus shrinking during this time. So um, I think it's member engagement, making sure that leaders lead. And I'm not always the face of the, of the union. It's our, it's our members, it's our activists. We did our videos about the dues restructure. It wasn't me blasting a video out on Zoom. It was our activists that led that campaign. And we just made sure that they had the, the tools to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. Can I can I just pile on to that for one second before we? Um, that's so true. And um, uh, you know, I think that what's what's about this historical moment and that we talked about with COVID and building back. People see the difference in people who have a union and people who have a, who don't have a union. People understand in a way that is deeper than I think they ever have the levels of inequality um, that they're facing. Um, and so it really is up to us to show up and be there for those kind of uh, moments. And we see what's happened in Alabama with the Amazon 
uh, organizing. Um, we see a president who unabashedly says, join a union again. Uh, we see the public opinion of unions being higher than it's been in decades. And so what do we do with this moment? You know, do we really uh, present ourselves as an alternative for people to engage with? Um, you know, you talked about the vaccines. You know, one of the th things that we've worked um, is we have a citizenship campaign that we've been running across the state where we um, where we help folks who are eligible to become citizens um, through that process that's so, such a labyrinth. Um, and it's all about showing up in communities that, and like you said, Doug, not parachuting in, but connecting and, and growing together. This is great. So un unfortunately, we have about six minutes, five or six minutes. So I'm going to give each of the panelists a chance to go around. One possible thing you could address is, you know, what's your biggest challenge? Like what next? What can we do to help you? Um, or maybe what is your biggest success? So uh, each of you have about two minutes and we've got a very hard uh, deadline at 1120. Thank you. Um, let's start with. Doug. Oof. Um, biggest challenge right now. Um, I would say we have contracts in counties that we have that we we represent 21 counties in California. In some of our counties, we have not had been able to get a contract. They're rural counties, anti-union. And uh, what could help is if we had statewide bargaining where there's two contracts, the SEIU contract and the UDW contract, uh, which we're gonna propose. Uh, but when listening to Lisa, we need a financing piece <laughs> on how you're gonna pay for that. So we're, we're figuring that piece out. That's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, and to just continue to do the work that we've been doing around you know, connecting our work with, with social justice. I mean, when you think about the founding of our union, it was one of three unions founded by people of color. A. Philip Randolph founded the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Cesar Chavez founded the Farm Workers and Ken M. Samaji and Fahari Jeffers uh, founded UDW. So we always say social justice is in our DNA. We, we tie everything that we do through a racial equity lens, all of our education and trainings. We talk about that. We're, we're not afraid to talk about it, irregardless of who the audience is, but sometimes you just make sure you got to have the right messenger going into the right places to give that message. So we're, we're very proud of our history. We're going to continue this work and uh, around social justice. And um, I think our members understand it a lot more now than they did before because we are public with it. Thank you, Doug. Rick. Yeah, so... Um... Our biggest, well, first I have to give a shout out to my brother, Ed Sills, who is a graduate of Cornell. So, I mean, I, I hope that uh, you, Cornell's continuing to throw out good things. Um, but our biggest challenge is right across the street. We have a state government that is hell bent on voter suppression, on stripping the ability of workers to join unions, of maintaining this right to work economy um, that works for them, but doesn't work for us. Um, we, uh, we have to understand that the, our response to that is to continue to build power in our workplaces and build power in our communities. Um, there are cities and counties across Texas where millions and millions of people live, where if they are allowed to govern themselves, can start to implement policies that can really, implement, really impact the, the lives of working people. Our job is to build that power um, and face up to the folks across the street who want to take it away. Because like Doug says, is um, we have to, it has to be a broad movement that incorporates the fullness of our membership and the fullness of each of us as human beings, uh, because that is the only way uh, that we're going to be able to overcome the attacks against us. It's solidarity, it's organizing, it's activism, um, and hopefully it'll be victory. Wonderful, Rick. Lisa. We'll end with you. All right. So that was a that was a great that was a great ending sentence, uh, Rick. I think that's I think that's uh, exactly right. I mean, I think there are there are so many specific uh, problems that uh, each of us and 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 other people and organizations face, and um, the you know the are 
the forces that oppose change in these areas are, you know, it's, it's not, it was not just a, it wasn't just the Trump administration, right? There are, uh, are many decades of uh, the promotion and deregulation of finance um, and of the disempowering of workers and, and communities. And so figuring out how we uh, work together across and organize together uh, across uh, specific uh, immediate priorities to be better able to uh, take on really powerful interests whose whose money has allowed them to buy influence uh, on both parties and all kinds of, pol of policy um, so as to get at really big changes um, is I think the you know the, the, the greatest challenge how to how to have all of our think of find ways to have all of our work uh, add up to more than the sum of its individual parts to get it some of the underlying uh, levers uh, is the is the challenge that I think we face and that I'm excited to keep learning from people about how to take on. Thank you so much, uh, Doug, uh, Lisa and Rick. You've been fabulous. The questions from the audience have been fabulous. We still have over 95% of the people who started in the audience are still with us. And so thank you, we do have to close and I hope you all go back to the uh, plenary session to hear the closing remarks from distinguished panel panelists. So thank you all. And uh, for more information on these various uh, studies and websites, please go to um, the Worker Institute. We didn't have time to introduce Sanjay who has a fabulous new report on essential workers at um, uh, during the pandemic. I'm sorry about that, Sanjay. Too many questions and go to the, our website to find that as well. Thank you and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Rose. Hello. And Doug, if you wanna come back to Texas, come on, we'll have any time. You can, you can even parachute in. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, when I go to Texas, I stay for a while. My relatives all live out there. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.